Okay, don't worry. I got it. All right. <laughs> I appreciate all the help that we've got. Um, I, I threw some people into some new technology and trying, but um, it takes all of us today. <laughs> so, um, it, and just so you know, this Grace Transformational Ministries was born to be a very technical ministry because the vision that God originally gave me was basically to reach people online who don't come to church. We want to reach those people. And so our whole infrastructure is based on that. And that's the help that we actually need. So when something doesn't work right, then we're not actually, we're do, not doing what we were actually designed to do. We always need you to help us to do that. And that's really our goal. So um, I'll have some places for you to sign up before we leave. <laughs> <laughs> but today our message is a new series that I'm starting. It's, it's the series, the name of the series is By Design. And there are many things that, several things, there are five things that God actually designed you to be, designed to be. So a lot of times we look at what we're designed to do or what we're supposed to do, but these are things that God designed you to be so that you can be who he created you to be. So today, the first one, we're going to talk about design to believe. That's part one. And um, so my monitor is not on up here. Can, Devante, can you turn this on so I can see without always looking behind me? If that's, if, if that's doable. That's, yeah, gotcha. Thank you. But... Um, we're also going to talk about part two is you're designed to belong. You're designed to belong to a family. You're designed to belong to uh, a group of people, community. God designed us to fellowship. Thank you. God designed us to fellowship. He also designed us to blossom. He designed, if you notice, I tried to do everything with a B, but it didn't work out that way. Designed to believe, designed to belong, designed to blossom. Really, that's about growing. I tried to find a B. I even used the everything. Then um, the other one, he designed you for service. So I said, be of service. <laughs> so he designed us, you to be of service. And he also designed you to contribute, to give back, um, whether that's your community, your family, your church, your, your work life. But you were designed that way. You want to do that. Even if you didn't know God, you didn't know anything, you as a human being are designed to do that. So today, we're going to just talk about be a design to believe. God has designed you to believe. Even agnostics, atheists, they are designed to believe. God wants you to believe. Whether you're a believer, whether you're a Christian, as I said, whether you are an atheist or anywhere in between on that spectrum, we all wonder. Even if you're a Christian, things you wonder about. Even if you've been, you know, um, I became a Christian. I was born. <laughs> I was born as a baby. My family, my mom, her dad, my my grandfather. He was really he was my um, father. He was the father of the gospel to me. He was the person who turned my life around when I when I left Mississippi, went to Chicago. I see I have some family members here today, so. You might hear some things that you possibly never heard before. Um, but when, when I moved away, I turned away from God and ran away as hard as I could in Chicago. Um, Chicago, well, I guess I shouldn't just say that. I was going to say it's no place for children. But uh, it was not a place for me. I got into so much trouble. And wow, my eight-year-old granddaughter is listening to this. I got into so, Charlie, I did. I got into so much trouble when I was in Chicago. Um, I joined a street gang, um, got into all kinds of stuff, police, chased by the police, outran the police. You wouldn't believe. We lived in Chicago on Washington Boulevard, 4852, if anybody want to check it out. That was the second house from the corner, but all of the houses had these flat roofs for the whole block. We would get into trouble. Police would chase us 
we go, one of our buddies, you could go up on his, on his back porch and get up on the roof. We get up on the roof and, and run the whole block, jumping from one house to the next house, come down somewhere else, and the police wouldn't know where we were. And so don't ever try that. And the first time I tried that, I was scared out of my mind. But I was scared not to follow. And so you, I felt pressure. But, you know, when, when God designed you to believe, even if you didn't have the background that I had. So I got so far out there. And mind you, I was only 10. I was only 10 exposed to way more than I ever should have been exposed to, doing way more than I ever should have done. Uh, I mean, they taught me how to steal because I wouldn't steal. They, we, as a group, we go to a store, and, and I just couldn't do it. So they, they made, me the, we made me the lookout guy. You know, I'd stay on the bike. They'd go and steal some stuff, jump on the bike, and then I'd take off, and we ride. But they eventually taught me, just go in with your coat on, and they put stuff in my pocket, you know, and then I'd just walk out. But so they were just training me to get further and further and further away. And it got so bad that there are so many stories I could tell you, but we don't have time today or tomorrow. <laughs> and, but um, I decided at the age of 10 that I could not sustain that lifestyle. I hid all of that from my siblings. I hid all of that from my parents. And one day, standing in my living room, which there were about 19 people lived in this three-bedroom apartment. That was two families, my dad, his eight kids, and his brother, and his six kids, seven kids, and my, all of the parents and my great-grandmother. That's how many people lived in three bedroom, three bedroom. And every bedroom probably had three beds in it. <laughs> but uh, standing in that living room, I remember standing there that day, praying as a 10-year-old. Because at this point, I had gotten out of the gang. I was too afraid to do what they were doing. Um, I had almost been killed. <laughs> it's just, and I didn't want no more parts of it. But now... The gang don't just let you walk away. And so now I can't even leave home because they're after me. My mom would try to send me to the store. Everywhere I went, I ran as fast as I could. And people probably didn't want to know, what was going on with that guy? He's always running. And I just ran everywhere. That's, but that day, standing in the living room, I said, God, I just need you to help me. I said, if you can help me to get back to Mississippi, and live with my granddaddy, I will be all right. And that's what turned my life around. After school that year, when my parents went down to visit, I begged them to let me stay. And that's how I ended up living with my grandfather, turning my whole life around, I, sitting on the front pew one day, because I still, you know, I, was, I still had some of that old stuff in me when I first moved down there. Sitting on the front pew one day, and he was preaching out of Joshua 15, 24. And he said, choose ye this day whom ye will serve. But for me and my house, what, who knows the scripture? We go serve the Lord. And that convicted me sitting on the front. I was like, wow, so if I'm going to live in granddaddy's house, I got to get right. And that's, I made that choice that day and never walked back, never turned back. And so that was my step of believing. But everyone didn't have that kind of background to go back to. There are so many people, so many parents, so many grandparents. No one, everyone don't have that kind of heritage that they can lean back on. And that's one reason why I enjoy doing the, the baby dedication today. We need to create new heritage for new babies where their, grandba where their grandparents know Jesus. <laughs> their grandparents know how to pray. You know, someone wrote a song talking about I had a praying grandmother. If it wasn't for my praying grandmother, and Thomasine know what I'm talking about. You, guys, you should hear some of her grandmother's stories. And so um, 
I have a question for you today to get right into this. And my question is this, as it relates to your faith and your trust in God, and have you ever gone through a season of doubt or just wondered, where is God when you're in any specific situation or specific area of your life? How many of you ever been there? Just, yeah, all of us, right? We got a few people who are just as good as Jesus, but anyway. So... <laughs> Just kidding. The next question is this. If the answer is true, and most of you raise your hand, what did you doubt about God? Was it, was it, what was it about God that you doubted? Can you remember that? Or what did you doubt about yourself? Uh, or the timing, or the, whatever you expected the answer to be. What was it that you doubted? I want to show you in Scripture where from the beginning, God designed us to believe. He designed us to just trust him. He designed us to, um, you see, you've heard the creation story um, where God created everything, created the heavens and the earth and the light and the, you know, the planets and all of this. And so I want to start where he actually began to make man. And he said, let us make man. And so Here's the scripture, uh, Genesis, the first chapter, 26th verse. If you'd like to turn there, um, feel free to do that, but we, I'll put the scripture on the screen for you. It says, then God said, let us make man. Now, before this place in scripture, when God made everything else, when he, when he created the light, what did he say? Let there be light. When he created, you know, the earth and all of that, he said, let the waters be divided, and let the let man come forth and let the earth bring forth grass and let it bring forth herbs and a tree. It was always impersonal. Let it be. But here we have, he begins to make man and he said what? Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. See, the us here is the Godhead. God is creating man and God is a spiritual being. So you are a spiritual being. When he says in our image, we are spiritual beings, but God wants us to actually develop the character that he has because the character has to be developed because when he said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us, first of all, God created us so that we can make our own decisions. You can decide, you can, isn't that amazing? You can decide to reject the God that created you. He created you so you have that choice. And many people are exercising. <laughs> so, but that's the choice. That's the part of being a free moral agent. And so when he says, let us make human beings in our image to be like us, that means so that they can become like us, the same character that we have, the love that we have, that we actually have between each other, that they can develop that and become like us. But it's going to take some time for them to do that even before Adam sinned. But this is still laying out the everything here where he makes this particular choice. When he says, let, let us make human beings in our image so that they can be like us, then I'm going to show you in the second chapter, because the first chapter is about what God is saying he's going to do. The second chapter is how he did it and when he began to do it. It says, then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into a man's nostrils and the man became a living soul. So here it says God formed the man. And I want to show you two different words here because he made, he created human beings, but now he's forming the male. He's forming the man. It says God formed the man from the dust of the ground. The Hebrew word for formed there is the word squeezed out. God actually formed man out of the dust of the ground. And um, I want to show you, you know, I don't know, I don't read Hebrew, but I looked it up for you. That's the Hebrew word. I'm not going to even try to say it, but it means squeezed out. <laughs> and that's what the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He squeezed him out and from the dust of the ground. Now, here's what I notice when it comes to just believing what the word says, because scientists, many scientists don't believe that we were created. But there are scientists who have discovered 
that the same elements that's in the human flesh, in the human bones, um, in the human sinews, that's the same elements that's in the crust of the earth where plants grow from and everything else. And so I believe science and God agree. Many people think that's two different. I think when they get to the end of where they're going, they realize that, wow, God had it right all the time. There is a God. But you, it's the same elements that are there. Now, the Lord placed the man, I'm jumping down to the 15th verse. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it, but the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat of every fruit of the tree in the garden. Now, here we go, and this is where the belief starts to come in. Because he said, you can eat of every tree in the fruit of the garden. And he goes on to say, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of that fruit, what's going to happen? Now, I always thought this is interesting. Why would God do this? <laughs> it's like, why set this up? And, and the reason is because he has a choice, and he has to exercise his choice. God wants man to choose to believe him, not make him believe him. He wants him to choose to believe him. And so he said, hey, the day you eat of this, you're going to surely die. But there was another agent in the earth that also wanted man to believe him, and that was Satan, who came up as a serpent and said, you would not surely die. Remember that? <laughs> you would not surely die. Just the opposite of what God had said. And when, when, when God said, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you know, this is not God giving man, like, some rules of do's and don'ts. And many times we grow up in church, and that's what we felt like. And sometimes the churches didn't know any better, and that is what they did. It's like, here are the rules. That way I don't have to watch you. Here's the rules. You know, that way I don't have to put up with you when you, when you fail, when you miss it. Here are the rules. And some of us, even as parents today, that's how we do it. We want, it to, we want you to know the rules. This is the rules in this house. How many of you heard that? We got some rules in this house. And where really where love is abundant, then you don't need as many rules. Um, but it's hard for us to trust love and believe God that love can work its way around. So this was a warning. Man had to make his own choice. And that was the key here. He had to make his own choice. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper who is just right for him, which he's about to make Eve. Now, I want to show you something here. Drop down to the 21st verse. When we get down to the 21st verse, it says, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God did what? made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. Now, this is interesting, because this is a different Hebrew word. This doesn't mean he squeezed her out. This word, <laughs> this word, let me show you what this word, this word means built. So women are built. <laughs> Not squeezed out, but built. I'm not going to even try to say that Hebrew word either. But the Lord God made a woman. And so God's design here is free will, free choice, but he wanted man to believe him the first time. And that's where Eve and Adam failed. They didn't believe him the first time. They listen to the serpent. I want to warn you today, don't listen. <laughs> but we as children, we do that all the time. You, you want your kids, you, when you know something's good for your child, you tell them. You want them to believe you. But many times, they just have to experience it themselves before they realize. How many of you did that yourself when you were a child? Amen. All right. 
I know some of your parents don't want your kids to see you raising your hand on that. But this is, God wants us to trust him and believe him the very first time that what he's saying to us, about us, and for us is actually for our best good. That's really what he's saying. This, and I know it don't, might not look like it, but he's saying, trust me, this is, this, I want you to believe me the first time, because he said you'll surely die. And they probably thought, you know, after they took their first bite and didn't fall over, <laughs> you know, they probably thought, hmm, maybe the serpent is right, because I ain't dead yet. But then they began to realize that that death was their separation from God. You know, uh, God wanted them to believe him that death was their separation. Now, the celebration of this weekend, this Easter weekend, is all about his redemption to get man back into his family. That's what, and we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus who paid the price for that. And so I want to bring in a New Testament writer, one of my favorite writers, because he was a researcher, and that's Luke, who talks about Jesus. Because if Jesus, if there was no Jesus, if Jesus wasn't born, if Jesus didn't die, and if Jesus was not raised from the dead, we'd all be men most miserable. Now, that's scripture. Here's the way I say it. If none of that was true, and you still believed it, personally, if, that, if I knew that was not true, I wouldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. If I knew that Jesus really didn't die and that Jesus really didn't ra wasn't raised from the dead, I wouldn't believe it. Now, many churches have tried to tell me, you need to believe this and just trust the word. You need to have faith in faith. But if you look at what Luke wrote down and what Luke wrote about Jesus, this is what Luke said in his scripture. In, in the first chapter of Luke, this is the NIV. He says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that I have been fulfilled, that have been fulfilled among us. Now, the first thing Luke is saying is that a lot of writers have tried to capture these things that we're talking about. When he says undertaken to draw up an account, he's talking about writing these things down, an official account that have been fulfilled. So some things have been fulfilled among us. Then he goes on to say, many have undertaken to draw up this account. And he says, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Now, many times when we hear the word, well, let me just tell you, when, he, when Luke is talking about the word here, he's talking about Jesus. He's equating Jesus to the word, which we know in John, John always equated Jesus with the word. He said, in the beginning was the word. And, but Luke is equating Jesus with the word. So he says, just as they were handed down, he's saying these things that have been written. So Luke was not one of the disciples. He was not one of the 12 disciples. He was a writer. He was someone who afterwards started collecting data. And he said, I went to eyewitnesses, people who were around, who were with Jesus, and who were there at the beginning. And so he's saying, so they handed down this stuff to us. Uh, from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the same. And then he goes on to say, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, that, that sounds like someone who wants some facts. That sounds like someone who wants some data. That sounds like someone who's digging for the truth. Not just, you know... The, you know, there was all kind of superstitious stuff going on at this time. And so he was like, away with all the superstition. This had, I, I got to find the truth. He said, so I too decided to write an orderly account. In other words, I decided to write an official account where I knew I did the investigation for you, O most Theophilus. Theophilus was a converted, basically a diplomat, but he believed in Jesus, was beginning to believe in Jesus. And so Luke is saying, based on what you have been taught, he said, let me just show you what he said. He said, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So he's saying, I did this for you. Luke didn't even write this. Luke didn't even to be in the Bible. Luke never knew this would make it into a book called the Bible. 
So this was not, you know, this was a letter to one person saying that I'm writing this for you so that you can know of certain of the things that you've heard of, the conversion that you are believing in, you can know for certain. And I'm saying to you today, you need to know for certain that Jesus died for you, that he rose from the dead, and you make decisions based on that, not just, see, I realized that my first year in college, I got to the point where I was starting to take some classes, and I realized one day that everything I believed was because my mama believed it and because her daddy believed it. I said, so, and I, it was a tough time for me. Never turned back, but going through that phase, I remember working at Meyer Thrifty Acres that, at that time, and emotionally, it, I was a wreck because I was cashier at Meyer, and there'd be times I'd be thinking about this, and tears would start to flow. And you know, I don't know if any of you ever worked at a grocery store, especially in the wintertime. Nobody wants to go outside and get carts. You know, everybody wants to stay inside. And Meyer wasn't like Meyer is today, open 24 hours. Whatever the time we were there, I forgot what the hours were. But there were times when nobody was in the store. And so I was going through so much emotional stuff that I, I always went out to get carts because I was an emotional wreck going through that. And God helped me to do enough research even at that time to solidify my faith, solidify what I believe, and know that this is what God wanted for me. So again, just focusing on a couple of words, he wanted Theophilus to know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. And so now, Luke, I'm going to jump to the fifth chapter and give you an example of a man um, that this happened with. So this is the fifth chapter, still Luke who writes this. He said, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of uh, Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. Again, listening to who? Jesus. It's not that Jesus was teaching the Bible. There was no Bible. They were listening to Jesus teach. The Bible wasn't written until a couple hundred years after Jesus had been raised from the dead. So as far as pulling all the books together, the New Testament books and the Old Testament books, so there really was no Bible. But Jesus was teaching. And as he was teaching, it says, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. Because they had never heard anybody teach like this before. They had never heard anybody teach with the authority that Jesus taught with. And as Jesus is teaching, it says, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. And then... He got into one of the boats. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, which is Peter, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So if you could imagine this, they're in a lake. There's the boats. Actually, these guys have been fishing all night long. This was the next morning, and these boats are here, and they're out cleaning their nets. And Peter's there, there and Jesus walks down, and he gets into Peter's boat. And they're, they're done fishing because you fish at night. And... He, Jesus gets in the boat and says, I'll push out for a way. And so Peter does this. Now, this wasn't Peter's first encounter with Jesus. Remember, who, who recruited Peter? Who know? Andrew, right? His brother. Andrew was one of the first disciples of Jesus who had been a disciple of John. And when Andrew started following Jesus, he went and got Peter, his brother. And so when Peter came to Jesus... Then the first thing Jesus did when he came, when Peter came to him and said, I'm going to your house. Now, that's different for us. We, we grew up thinking that religious people don't want to go to a non-religious person's house. Jesus said, I'm going to your house. So he went to his house. Remember it. Some of you remember this story. Peter's mother-in-law was sick. Jesus, while they're there, he prays for a mother-in-law. She's healed. So Peter experiences all this. And because she was healed, and this was the Sabbath, which means that you don't really do stuff until after sundown. After sundown, they went and got everybody sick in the community and brought them back to Peter's mother-in-law's house and so they could be healed. And it, Scripture says he healed them all. So Peter had experienced Jesus healing all of them. So now he goes out and these guys are fishing. And they fish all night long. 
and now they're done. And Jesus said, push out for a way, so basically, so he can teach the people. He taught the people. And so now, the next thing says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. So now, Jesus is asking Peter to do something that Peter is the expert at. Peter's the, he's the one that's been doing this all his life. He's a fisherman. He knows how to fish. So Jesus says, put out and let down your net for a catch. Not just to go fishing, but for a what? For a catch. So Simon answered and said, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Can you imagine that? They had worked all night, hadn't caught anything. He said, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. This is the key right here when he said, because you say so. It wasn't just he had to believe from not knowing anything. Peter had some experience. He, you healed my mother-in-law. You healed everybody we brought to the house that night. So I know you can, whatever God is doing through you, people can be healed. But I don't know what you're about to do now. But I know we are fishermen, and we've been fishing all night long. And plus, now it's daytime when you don't fish. We fish when you're supposed to be fishing, and we didn't catch anything. Now you're telling me to go out here in the middle of the lake in the middle of the day when we know fish aren't biting, and you want me to go out and you say for a catch. But he says, because you say so, I will let down the net. Many of you are in that place in your life where you need to just back up and stop and say, oh, okay, because you say so, think about all the other things that you've gone through that God has made a difference. And just like Peter, he could think, you know, you heal my mother-in-law, you heal all these other people. I don't know what you're about to do now, although this is my area. How many of you feel like this is my area? I know what I'm doing here. Jesus, you go preach. I'm catching fish. I know what I'm doing. He said, because you say so, I will let down the nets. Now, Peter had to believe in order to do. And that's why we're talking about believing, because you don't just do. We are human beings who believe first, and then we take action. Because the next scripture actually says, when they had what? That means let down the nets. Not think about it, not believe and talk about it, not discuss, you know, and say all the reasons. Because some of us, we're geared to find all the reasons why this won't work. And that's not bad. That's just, that's, that's your personality that God has given you. And we need people like that. We need people who see everything that's wrong. That's what sticks out. And they can easily say it. As soon as you say something that you're all excited about, they say, hey, but hey, what about this right here? And you never thought about that. And that's why God put them in your life, so that you'll think about that. <laughs> it's not so you can have a big argument. It's just so you can think about it. And now what ends up happening is when you put all that together, what you end up with is what you probably should have been doing in the first place. And so when Jesus, after they had done so, they, they said, okay. We're the professionals, but you've done some other stuff. Um, and we know that wasn't just, you know, uh, magic because these people were healed. Peter's mother-in-law was healed. He said they would do it. So after they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. They had never seen anything like this before. So... What did they do? They signaled their partners, James and John and all the rest of them, in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they both boats began to sink. Sounds like Jesus knew what he was doing. But look at Peter's response. When, Peter, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. 
That's powerful right there. Because if you notice in the previous verse when Jesus asked him to go out for a catch, he said, Master. So he recognized him as Master. He said, Master, we've been fishing all night long, and we didn't catch anything. But then he says, but because, you know, you said so, we'll do it. Now after he sees this, he says, he calls him Lord. He has gone from master to Lord. You, you're not all, you, not, not, you can do more than just heal people. You control nature. You, you know, you, you fill two boats. We've never had two boats full of fish before after fishing all night and never catching anything. He said, so just go away from me. And many times we feel the same way when we're in the presence and feel like there's, we're, you know, where God is or where he could be. We feel like we're so bad that God wouldn't want us around. And Jesus was just the opposite. And that's the way we have to learn to be too when we understand the grace of God. Um, there are many people, if you work in any kind of industrial environment, you know that it's not a sanctimonious place. It's a whole different language they speak. And where, where I work, some people know that I'm a minister. I don't even tell people. See, some people think that I'm trying to be incognito just because I don't want people to know. I want people to be themselves. I don't care if they cuss in front of me. It doesn't bother me at all. There are other people who know that, I, especially those who know that I'm a pastor, there have been times when people cuss around me. They say, don't be, stop that. Don't be cussing in front of him. And they'd be looking like. <laughs> and I just say, yeah, I have tender ears. I don't need to, don't need to hear that. But. When Peter said, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man, he is responding to the way all the other religious people did. People in the temple, they didn't, sinners couldn't get in there. They didn't want anything to do with sinners. They didn't want anything to do with people who did not follow what they thought was the word of God. He said, and, and for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken and so were James and John and the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. So all the fishing partners, they were all astonished at what, he, at what had happened. And so let me wipe, close this up. For he and all his companies were astonished. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled up their boats on the shore, left everything, and followed him. That's what Jesus wants us to do. Not necessarily that you got to walk away from everything else, but because of where they were in their lives, they said, we got enough fish to last, you know, we, can, we don't need to work for a couple of years. <laughs> we're going to follow you. So they followed Jesus. And I have a challenge for you today. And that challenge is this, to take courage, just to take a step. That step that Peter took was, he just said, just because you said so, I'm going to take this one little step. I, I don't know everything that's going to happen, but I'm going to take this one little step. So take courage and take your next step in your personal belief journey. We all have a personal belief journey. But take one step with Jesus. Learn to believe that God wants only what is best for you. And that's what he was trying to get Adam and Eve to realize. I only want what's best for you. So with, and that with full and complete joy, with no regrets. Most of the things that we went after for joy ourselves, we ended up with some regrets. How many know what I'm talking about? But God is saying, and Jesus is saying here, no regrets. Just trust me the first time. Believe me. So here's some action steps for you. And the challenge in action steps, we actually have, if you would like to take a, a, a hard copy with you, we have to print it out so um, you can take this with you. Our goal is that you do this, that you implement this, that you not just hear a word today and say, wow, that was pretty good. I like that. That was kind of fresh, new. 
and we want it to be relevant, but we want you to take it with you so that you can actually implement it in your daily life. And so we have this available for you. You can also, if you're on our website and you're watching online, you can just click on Weekly Challenge and you can download the PDF. So anyone can go and do that. You can download the PDF or just read the PDF, but you can download it, print it, do whatever you want to do with it. And so, but the action step here is spend some time alone with God. And that's a big part of our problem. We are so busy that there's never a time when there's not some noise or something going on, when God's been, God's been whispering all the time, but you can't hear him. I can't hear him. He's talking, but he, we can't hear him. Spend some time, even if it's five minutes. Anybody got five minutes? Just five minutes. Just say, I'm going to give God these five minutes. Spend some time alone with God each day for the next week and ask him to reveal your next step. And number one, consider what may be God's answer to your next step by just giving the Holy Spirit a chance to speak in your heart while you're listening and not multitasking. And that's what I just talked about. So just create some, some, some space. You know, in music, there, there are rest. There's not all notes. There's a rest somewhere so that there's some silence. How many of you ever heard just music, 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 and there's no pause it, it just gets on your nerves. And so there needs to be a rest. You need to stop and listen. And so create a space, even if it's just five minutes, where that gives God a, a part, a piece of your time. And then this is a good idea right here. Put on a worship song and just sing along or just listen to the music, allowing your mind to rest. Then after the song is done, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you your next step. It's just some quiet time, get some music, and music, and we're going to teach on this one day, but God created music for, to do certain things, to create certain environments, and it does that whether it's at church or whether it's in your bedroom or whether it's wherever you are, music works. <laughs> God created it. That's why, that's, that's why Satan had such a hard time, because he was the choir leader in heaven, and he decided he wanted to be God instead of just the choir and music leader. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. <laughs> so while listening, write down whatever thoughts come to your mind. This is really how you start to learn how to hear the Holy Spirit. Because you, you, he doesn't, you not. some people say they heard God say, but, and if they actually heard a voice, they run. But get in that environment, open your heart, and then just pay attention to the thoughts that come to your mind or come across your mind, and write them down. While listening, write down whatever thoughts come to your mind. Don't worry about what it is. Just write down the thoughts that come to your mind at that time. Then find some scripture, even if you have to help, have somebody help you. Find some scripture that support what you heard in your thoughts. And when you find the scripture, which is God's word, Allow it to begin to speak to you. Allow that scripture to begin to speak to you. And then the third thing, which is the last step, all belief is energy because belief is energy. All belief is energy. So release your energy in agreement with what God has already said and be like Peter and just trust him and do the next step. Like Peter said, you know, because you said so. Just do what Peter said. Believe and do because it, the scripture says, after they had done so. So you won't get the results until when? After you have done so. And so I would like to invite you today to take a step. And that step, we, there are multiple steps here. Now, first of all, I want to pray for you, for wherever you are right now. I want you to bow your heads, and then I'm going to give you an opportunity to take a step. Father, we thank you for this word today. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for what you've already done. Thank you for this word that even Luke penned. And we thank you for the grace that you give us today to make decisions, to have choices. And I pray, Father, that you would give each person the courage to make a choice to take the next step, whatever that step is for them. And we ask that you would bless them for it, give them the courage to do it, 
In Jesus' name.